namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Good evening, everyone. Okay, tonight we will be studying Sutta number 149, the Mahasalayatanika Sutta. This is the discourse on the great sixfold base. Or maybe it should be called the Great Sutta on the Sixfold Base. And you'll notice that in this last chapter of the Majjhimanikaya, quite a few of the suttas are concerned with the six sense bases. One explanation given why this is the case. It supports the idea that the earliest collection was the Sangyutta Nikaya. And one theory that I've read is that this chapter of the Majjhima Nikaya was originally part of the Sangyutta Nikaya. It was part of the chapter of the collected discourses on the six sense bases, the Salayatana Salayatana Sangyutta. And then this, some of the suttas from the Salayatana Sutta were taken out from the Sangyutta Nikaya and then put into the Majjhima Nikaya, perhaps in order to fill out an additional chapter so that the Majjhima Nikaya would have an even 150 suttas. So it turned out that some other suttas got in, so it turned out to have 152 suttas. Okay, so this sutta takes place again when the Buddha is living in Savati, and he announces to the monks, I will give you a discourse on the great sixfold base. Uh, so that the word great is part of the Buddha's introduction. Okay, so now the Buddha begins, he says, when one does not know and see the I as it actually is, when one does not know and see forms as they actually are, when one does not know and see I consciousness as it actually is, when one does not know and see I contact as it actually is, when one does not know and see as it actually is, the feeling which is felt as pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, that arises with I contact as condition. Okay, so just taking this part first. Okay, here we have the objects of not knowing and not seeing. I was going to erase what I had from last week, but I realized just before I put the eraser to the board that it's not necessary to erase it because we need that. Okay, I forms... I consciousness. It's all the whole cognitive process here. Then their coming together is eye contact. And then through the eye contact there arises the different types of feelings, 
pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant feeling, based upon that eye contact. Okay, so those are the objects. And then it said, one does not know and see this. Now, what is it being indicated by not knowing and not seeing? What kind of fundamental factor is involved here? Well, this is not knowing, not seeing. (laughs) Or put it in English. It's ignorance. This is ignorance. So not knowing and not seeing. This is ignorance. And so this ignorance is covering up the whole process of experience. It's covering up the I is the sense faculty the forms of the sense objects. I consciousness is the knowing of or the awareness of the forms through the I. The I contact is the coming together of consciousness with the forms. And then we have the different ways the forms can be experienced. Pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful neither painful nor pleasant. Okay, so when one doesn't know this and see this, all of these things, any of these things as they really are, then the Pali uses the word sarajati. Here it's translated one is inflamed by lust for the eye, or one becomes attached to the eye, or one becomes infatuated with the eye. One becomes infatuated or inflamed by attachment or by lust for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling felt as pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition. So here, on account of ignorance, not knowing and seeing these things as they really are, you could say that this craving or attachment sets in This attachment sets in for all of the different factors involved in the whole process of experience or cognition. So that this attachment settles down upon everything from the I. It's not that we single out the I and think I'm going to be attached to the I whether we think I'm going to be attached to eye consciousness, but just the attachment naturally settles down and becomes fixated upon the eye, upon forms, upon eye consciousness, and especially upon feeling. We could say the feeling is the strong fuel for this attachment. Okay, and this attachment or this inflammation that arises based upon all of these factors of experience, this is all signifying craving, tanha. So we have here a demonstration of how dependent origination is taking place in the process of experience itself, just in any event of seeing forms with the eye, when there's not an understanding with clear 
insight of what is taking place on that event of seeing, then this gives the opportunity for attachment, craving and attachment to settle in. Then what comes next? Okay, when one abides, when one lives inflamed by lust or when one lives in the grip of attachment, Okay, when one lives inflamed by lust, fettered, very strong word, sangyutasa, tied to it, then samulhasa, translated here, infatuated, but we could say confused or bewildered by it, deluded by it. Asadanupasino, perceiving gratification, contemplating gratification, always looking for some kind of, the word asada means literally it's sweet taste. I think the Chinese translators use wei in the sense of taste, pleasant taste. Okay, so when one is looking for this sweet taste and one is tied to this by craving, then the five aggregates, first I'll read, then I'll explain, the five aggregates affected by clinging are built up for oneself in the future. The word for oneself is added, but just translating words that are here, now I would translate the five aggregates subject to clinging go to future accumulation. That's a more literal translation. Okay, so now what is being indicated here is that it is this craving, this attachment rooted in one's present experience the craving that is the attachment rooted in one's experience of forms through the eye and this perceiving of the possibility of the sweet gratification in this experience. This forms the seed or potential that goes to build up a renewal of the five aggregates coming into being again in the future. In other words, this craving that attaches itself to this present, to this present experience becomes the propelling force that brings about a renewal of the process of experience in a future existence. So that the craving functions as the seed for the occurrence of rebirth. It's not that there is some kind of soul entity, a soul or a self that goes from one life to the next, but it is the craving that is continually inflamed right now that will bring about an arising of a new existence in the future. And that new existence in the future will be constituted 
by the coming into being of these five aggregates, these five components of existence. And so one can say that in the present, as we are acting on the basis of craving, then we are building up, we are accumulating the five aggregates that will come into being in the future. Right now, we are constituted of these five aggregates. What they are will come to in a little while. Within these five aggregates, there is craving or clinging. And this craving or clinging that holds to the present five aggregates is itself the seed that will bring into existence a new set of five aggregates. And that new set of five aggregates will form the basis or foundation for new craving, new clinging. And that new craving and clinging will build up a new set of five aggregates in the existence after that. It's somewhat like a fruit with a kernel inside, which is the seed. And so when we eat the fruit, then we take the seed and plant it, and that seed will bring out, bring up the tree, which has more fruits. And then we take one of those fruits and take its seed and plant it and grow another tree. And so on and on. And so the five aggregates are built up for oneself in the future. And then one's craving as one is attached One's craving, and as described as craving, which brings renewal of existence, accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this and that, one's craving increases. Then one's, as craving increases, then one's bodily and mental troubles increase. One's bodily and mental torments increase. One's bodily and mental fevers increase. Here, the word fever is being used metaphorically. It doesn't mean literally getting a fever, but it means the fever of mental disturbances. And one experiences bodily and mental suffering. I know this is strong language. (laughs) But this is a very powerful sutra. (laughs) Okay, now the same thing is repeated for each of the other senses and their objects. The ear and sounds, nose and odors, tongue and taste, body and tactile objects the mind and mental phenomena. Okay, this much up to this point, this is dealing with the side of the teaching which is called, you call it the samsaric side of the teaching. We can say that that is dealing with dependent origination in the side of arising, the aspect of arising. We could say that this is showing the noble truths of suffering and the origination of suffering. Okay, now with paragraph nine, we have a shift 
to the side of the teaching dealing with the ending of samsara, with the side of liberation. And this is just the converse of what has come previously. When one knows and sees the eye as it actually is, when one knows and sees forms as they actually are, when one knows and sees eye consciousness as it actually is, when one knows and sees eye contact as it actually is, when one knows and, and sees as it actually is, the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition, then one is not inflamed by lust for the eye, for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with eye contact as condition. Okay, when one knows and sees the eye as it actually is, what is this? What is it? Say it. Wisdom. wisdom. This is wisdom. This is panya. Knowing and seeing things as they really are. Okay, so when one sees, knows and sees things as they really are, then this craving or the attachment starts to subside. This is the ending or seizing of craving. Okay, and so when one abides, when one dwells, not inflamed by lust, not fettered, not infatuated or not confused, then contemplating the danger or disadvantage in them. The danger or disadvantage is that all of these things, the eye forms, eye consciousness are impermanent, unsatisfactory, subject to change. Okay, so when one is contemplating in this way, then the five aggregates subject to clinging are diminished in the future. They go to future decrease. They go to future demolition. Instead of accumulation, it's demolition. Demolishing the structure of the five aggregates. And then one's craving is abandoned. Okay, one's bodily and mental troubles are then abandoned. One's bodily and mental torments are abandoned. One's bodily and mental fevers are abandoned. And one experiences bodily and mental pleasure. You know, one experiences happiness, physical happiness, and mental happiness. Okay, so this is now all showing what happens when wisdom arises. And the wisdom, it's the wisdom which knows and sees everything in this process of experience, process of cognition, as it really is.
And to know and see things as they really are means what? To see them how? You know, now when it, to see, know and see the eye as it is. To see, know and see the eye how? You could say it that way, yeah. Oh, one could say in terms of the three characteristics, impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self. But one could also say simply to see them as impermanent. Even impermanence is a, alone is enough sometimes. Okay, and what comes next is interesting. Now the Buddha says, the view of a person such as this is right view. Now a person who's engaged in this contemplation, knowing and seeing all of these things as they really are, that viewing of these things as they really are, that seeing, that is right view. His intention, that is the motivation, the purpose, is right intention. His effort, the effort that he's making in engaging in that contemplation of the I forms and so on as they really are, that is right effort. His mindfulness, being mindful of the I forms, I consciousness as they really are, being mindful of them as being impermanent, unsatisfactory, subject to change. That is right mindfulness. And his concentration or that unification of mind, the absorption of the mind in that process of contemplation, That is right concentration. But here, for this practitioner, the Buddha doesn't have to bring in right action, right speech, and right livelihood. But rather, he says, His bodily action, his verbal action, and his livelihood have already been well purified earlier. So those are his his right speech, right action, and right livelihood. That is already taken care of for that practitioner. So he already has that solid foundation of the three morality factors. Now he's working, he's brought together the other five factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, the three that are considered the concentration factors and the two that are considered the wisdom factors. But they're all working together, those five factors, in that contemplation of things as they really are. So in this way, now, this Noble Eightfold Path comes to fulfillment in him by development. Bhavana Paripurin Gachanti. And as he is developing this Noble Eightfold Path, all the other members of the 37 aids to enlightenment, which form seven groups, all of them simultaneously are coming to fulfillment 
by development. We have the four foundations of mindfulness, or four establishments of mindfulness. Quick surprise test. What are the four foundations of mindfulness? Uh, <clears throat> body, feeling, mind, mind, mind. <laughs> Those are the four objects. <laughs> okay. It's contemplation of the body. Contemplation of feeling. Contemplation of mind. And I don't really like the translation mind objects. Contemplation of dhammas. Untranslatable. Contemplation of I say things organized in according to the principles of the teaching. Okay, then the four kinds of striving or the four right efforts come to fulfillment in him by development. What are the four right efforts? The effort to prevent unwholesome things from arising, the effort to prevent unwholesome things that have arisen, the effort to uh, bring about wholesome things that have not come about, and the effort to develop wholesome things that have already come about. Okay, very good. Let me repeat it for the people out there in the audience who are listening on the either on on the recorder recording. Okay, it's the effort to prevent unarisen, unwholesome things, states from arising, the effort to abandon unwholesome mental states that have already arisen, the effort to arouse or bring into being wholesome qualities that have not yet arisen, and the effort to stabilize and to perfect wholesome mental qualities that have already arisen. Okay, the four bases for spiritual power also come to fulfillment in him by development. Anybody want to tackle this one? This is a little more probably unless you knew that a surprise quiz was coming, you wouldn't have made an effort to study this. Can I get it without looking? <laughs> um, um, um. It's the basis for spiritual power, which is, see, dominated by desire and has volitional formations. The whole formula, or even that, I don't remember. Two. <laughs> has volitional formations of striving. The basis for spiritual power, which has samadhi or concentration dominated by desire and volitional formations due to striving. See, I have to cheat. (laughs) Yeah, a Monk develops the basis of spiritual power consisting in concentration due to desire and determined striving, but later I used volitional formations of striving. Okay, then the basis for spiritual power, which has concentration due to virya, to energy, and volitional formations of striving. The basis for spiritual power, which has concentration due to mind and volitional formations of striving. 
and the basis for spiritual power which has concentration due to investigation and volitional formations of striving. Okay, and then the five faculties come to fulfillment in him by development. Oh, why is there laughing? Because I only got three. <laughs> I got the energy, mind, and investigation. The first one was desire. desire. Yeah. Okay, the five faculties come to fulfillment in him by development. Oh, my memory very weak today. Who's going to help me find the five faculties? No looking up the index. Oh, no. Cheaters. Oh, no, you you give lectures on these. You're not allowed. You've already answered. Let's get some of the others who are eager to score some points. Great. Uh, faith. Yeah. Energy. Yeah. Mindfulness. Concentration. Yeah. And equanimity. You're doing very, very well. No. Of course. <laughs> For the recorder, the faculties are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And what are the five powers? I don't know if we've ever explained them separately. No, because I don't think I've ever given separate, had a separate discussion of them. Except maybe just that one time when I did that, when they occur in the sutta, and I think I would have dealt with them very, very briefly. Because the five powers are actually the same by name as the five faculties. It's faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. It's just that they're considered faculties when they have the function of exercising a leadership role or a governing role in a particular sphere or domain. And then when they become very strong and powerful so that they cannot be overcome by their opposites, then they're considered the five powers. Then the seven enlightenment factors come to fulfillment in him by development. Okay, good. Okay. Mindfulness. Yeah. Contemplation of the Dharma. Yeah. We call it investigation of the Dharmas. Okay. Energy. Yeah. Joy or rapture. Yeah. Relaxation or tranquility. Good. Yeah. Concentration. Yeah. Excellent. That's where your equanimity, Marcy. That's where the, your last equanimity comes in as the last factor. Okay, the microphone is complaining. It wants to get it for the recorder. The seven factors of enlightenment are mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, joy or rapture, tranquility or relaxation, concentration, and equanimity. If anybody wants, hasn't had these explained at length, the explanations will be 
in the course of the lectures on Sutta number 77, Majjhima Nikaya number 77, there are CDs, first series, second series, I'm not sure which one. I think it's a second series. But I have the CDs for the second series. Anybody didn't get that CD, I could give them a copy. So I won't explain them here. Okay, and then these two things, these two qualities occur in him yoked evenly together. What are the two? Serenity and insight. Samatha and Vipassana. This is very important because it's very common to think that serenity and insight, Samatha and Vipassana, two different types of meditation. You're either doing Samatha or Vipassana. That's the modern way of understanding. But that's not such a correct understanding that when the practice comes to maturity, then these two factors are brought into balance, brought into harmony, so that there's both serenity or samatha and vipassana yoked together, occurring together. The serenity aspect is contributed by the samadhi, by the right concentration. The insight aspect is contributed by this wisdom which now takes the form of the contemplation of things as they really are. And so now in this very high point of contemplation, the two are brought into balance And so they are now yoked evenly together. In the earlier stages, sometimes one will be focusing, emphasizing serenity, sometimes emphasizing insight. But then when the path, in order to reach the world transcending path, the serenity and the insight have to come together until that Insight is based securely on this serenity. The serenity means the concentration of mind, the stability of mind. So the mind occurs continually, sustained on the object without falling off the object. And the insight is the deep seeing into the nature of phenomena. Okay, and now when these two come together evenly, then there comes this penetration by direct knowledge which opens up the world transcending path. And so now there takes place these important functions indicated by the next few sentences. These sentences are very, very important what comes next. He fully understands by direct knowledge those things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge. He abandons by direct knowledge those things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. He develops by direct knowledge those things that should be developed by direct knowledge. He realizes by direct knowledge those things that should be realized by direct knowledge. You could say that the whole practice of the higher teaching of the Buddha is summed up in those four sentences to fully understand that 
which should be fully understood, to abandon that which should be abandoned, to develop that which should be developed, and to realize that which should be realized. Okay, then in the next passage, the Buddha raises the questions. Okay, what should be fully understood by direct knowledge? And then the answer to that is the five aggregates subject to clinging. That is bodily form, physical form, feelings, perceptions, the mental formations, volitional formations, and consciousness. That is, all of these five aggregates, the five constituents of experience that are bound up with clinging. These five aggregates are the things that should be fully understood. One has to fully understand what is the specific nature of bodily form? What is the specific nature of feeling? What is the specific nature of perception? What is the specific nature of formations? What is the specific nature of consciousness? That's one aspect of full understanding, to understand the specific nature of each of the five aggregates. The second aspect of fully understanding them is to understand their general characteristics, to understand that each of these five aggregates is impermanent, connected with suffering and not self. And then the third aspect of fully understanding the five aggregates is to eliminate all the distorted views or distorted perceptions regarding each of the five aggregates. Okay, then, what are the things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge? The two things to be abandoned by direct knowledge are ignorance, and craving for being, craving for continued existence in samsara. You could also say three things, greed, hatred, and delusion are to be abandoned by direct knowledge. Or one could say another three things, the taint of sensual desire, the taint of craving for existence, the taint of ignorance. But here it said very simply, ignorance and craving for existence. Those are the two roots of the two most fundamental roots of samsaric becoming. Okay, and what are the things that should be developed by direct knowledge? Often the Buddha will say what should be developed is the Noble Eightfold Path. But sometimes he'll say any of these groups amongst the 37 aids to enlightenment. But here he just puts it very simply and says, The two things to be developed are serenity and insight, calm or concentration and wisdom.
that's because it seems here the Buddha is speaking to those who have already developed the practice of the path to a very high extent. And so he's just showing once you already have the morality factors, you already have faith, energy, mindfulness. So what do you have to do? You just have to bring serenity and insight into balance and then strengthen them. And then they will accomplish all the rest of the work. And then what are the things to be realized by direct knowledge? Vija vimuti. That is true knowledge, or final knowledge, and deliverance or liberation. These are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. Okay, now we have to realize or remember that this whole scheme has all been elaborated just based upon the I and forms. Everything de- developed off the I sense faculty. But now the whole thing is can be repeated Everything that we have in 9, 10, and 11 can be repeated for the ear, then for the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And in that way, these sections, 9, 10, and 11, can be blown up or brought in for each of the other sense bases. And in that way, the sutta can be expanded (laughs) till five times its present length. Okay, and that's what the Buddha said. And then the monks were satisfied and delighted in the Buddha's words. Okay, any questions? Did you explain in the beginning the book in the beginning the third in the third paragraph the Buddha explained in terms of the six senses, but later on in paragraph eleven the book the Buddha speaks in the theme of the five senses. He doesn't actually change the scheme. It's just that now he is using he's using the six sense bases as the scheme for the elaboration of the sutta. But you see, when he speaks about this this particular pattern of things to be fully understood. This is referring to the, it's actually conforming to the pattern of the Four Noble Truths. And so, the Noble Truth that is to be fully understood is the Noble Truth of suffering, of Dukkha. And in the Buddha's explanation of the Four Noble, of the First Noble Truth, he sums up the explanation of the first noble truth by saying, in, in short, in brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging are dukkha. And so here the Buddha is saying, he's explaining what is to be fully understood. And so instead of bringing in all of the elements of the, of the first noble truth, all the different aspects of the noble truth of suffering, just to deal with it very concisely, he brings in the five aggregates which represent the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering.
In fact, this reminds me of a point that maybe I should make that I didn't make in the actual presentation explanation of the sutta. This fourfold pattern that's developed here in paragraph 11 of fully, fully understanding, abandoning, developing, and realizing. This is what we meet in the first discourse of the Buddha. After the Buddha has elaborated each of the Four Noble Truths, when he first introduces the Four Noble Truths, then there comes a section where the Buddha speaks about the functions that are to be formed, the functions that are to be performed with respect to each of the Four Noble Truths. And he says, first, this Noble Truth of Suffering is to be fully understood. Then, this Noble Truth of the Origin of Suffering is to be abandoned. Then, this Noble Truth of the Cessation of Suffering is to be realized and this noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. And so already in the Buddha's first discourse we have these four functions or four tasks being introduced And these four tasks become a kind of, I could say, a particular, maybe you could call this a lens through which one can view almost any passage in the Buddha's teaching and use that particular lens to inquire what function does this passage serve in the teaching? Is this passage pointing out something that is to be fully understood? Like many of the sutras dealing with the five aggregates or also sometimes with the six sense bases are dealing with things to be understood. The sutta is dealing with the 18 elements also, things to be understood, explaining the nature of the five aggregates, the six sense bases, the 18 elements. Or maybe is the passage dealing with things that are to be abandoned? Those would be suttas that deal with the defilements, with ignorance, with craving, with the hindrances, with the fetters. So wherever you come across sentences, paragraphs, whole suttas dealing with those things, then you understand, you apply that particular function. This passage, sentence, text is dealing with something to be abandoned. Then the suttas dealing with descriptions of the goal, suttas dealing with sentences, paragraphs dealing with Nibbana, or dealing with the state of liberation, dealing with the final knowledge. Those are describing the things to be realized. And then all of the suttas dealing with the different aspects of the practices, whether it's the Noble Eightfold Path, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, the development of the spiritual faculties, the Seven Factors of Enlightenment, then you understand these suttas are concerned with explaining or demonstrating those things that are to be practiced, that are to be developed. So, 
even though the suttas seem to be so different and so many different themes, but if you have these four basic ideas, four basic functions in mind, then you could use them as a method for grouping or organizing all the different teachings. I'm not saying that every teaching will come into that scheme, but many, many of them. And then there's a sutta where the Buddha was asked <laughs> you claim to be a Buddha on what basis do you can you say that you are a Buddha? Then the Buddha said he stated a verse in reply to a Brahmin who asked him that question. The Buddha said those things that should be fully understood, those I have fully understood. Those things that should be abandoned, I have abandoned. What should be developed, I have developed. Therefore, O Brahman, I am a Buddha. He didn't mention that he has realized what should be realized. That's because the, the line of verse could only take four lines. That's because the verse could only take four lines. <laughs> but when he mentions those three, then we could also understand that the fourth should also be brought in to complete the pattern. Okay, any further questions? Yeah. Okay, good question. You're asking, what is the difference between fully understand and to realize? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, it's better to use the Pali words. Yeah, the, the word for fully understand is parinya. Okay, so parinya means parinya comes from the root nya, which means to know. And pari gives the sense of fullness. So parinya implies a fullness of knowledge. So to gain parinya means that one has to investigate something and one builds up an increasing knowledge and understanding of it, going through stages, a kind of deepening, widening, expanding knowledge, until that knowledge and understanding reaches a certain fullness, completeness. And in the Buddhist text, this full understanding, it's always applied to conditioned phenomena. It applies to the conditioned phenomena of the five aggregates. Generally, it's applied to the conditioned phenomena of the five aggregates or the first noble truth. It could also apply to the six sense bases. Now, the word that's translated realize or realization is sachi kiriya, which comes from this sachi plus kiriya. Okay, the first part, sachi, is based on a word which means to witness, to see with one's own eyes. And kiriya means action. It's the activity of making visible with one's own eyes. So this is not something that comes about through 
a gradual accumulation or increasing of knowledge or understanding, but what happens when the knowledge and understanding through the full understanding of the truth, of the true nature of the five aggregates reaches completion, then there comes the breakthrough to the unconditioned, to nirvana. And nirvana is really the object of realization. So what happens is that when one fully understands the nature of the five aggregates, then the mind's wisdom sees beyond the five aggregates and sees that which lies, let's see, when one's understanding of the five aggregates reaches fullness or completeness, then one sees that which is beyond the five aggregates. That which is beyond the five aggregates is Nibbana, Nirvana, the unconditioned, unborn, unchanging, deathless. And that is an object of realization. It's not something that one builds up in a expanding, increasing, augmenting knowledge about. It's not an object of insight knowledge, but it's an object that when the five aggregates fall away, then the unconditioned presents itself. And so it's the unconditioned is directly realized But also in this sutta, it's said that one realizes in the sense of attains, one attains true knowledge and liberation. Here, one could understand that one experiences true knowledge and liberation, that this is like the end, end product of the, the development of the path. But the achievement of full understanding, that is something that occurs in the course of practicing the path. Yeah, one fully understands the first noble truth. One realizes the third noble truth. Yeah, but here is a change in a normal order here we have the things that one develops by direct knowledge, serenity and insight. That is put in the position of the fourth noble truth. And here we have the things to be realized by direct knowledge. This is true knowledge and deliverance. This is where we would normally have the third noble truth. But the order is changed here for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now. <laughs> so next week then we do I think it's the larger discourse on the Mahati Padopamasutta. The larger discourse on the elephant's footprint simile. That's correct. That's number 28, Sutta number 28. That's also a very interesting Sutta. Okay, we share the merit, and by sharing the merits. Akasata chabhumata devanagamahitika Punyantang anumotitva chirang rakantu sahasanam akasata chabumata 
Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakan Today Sanang Akasa Tachabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakan Tumang Parang Etavata chaam hehe sampadang punya sampadang Sabe deva anumodantu Saba sampati sedia Etavata chaam hehe sampadang punya sampadang Sabe buta anumodantu Saba sampati sedia Etavatajam hehe sampadang punya sampadang Sabe sata anumodantu Saba sampati sedia Bavagupadaya avici hate to Etanta rei Rupi arupi cha asanya sanino Dukkha pamuchantu pusantu niputin